Um, thank you for being here this morning. It's my pleasure to um, to welcome Anthony Levera, um, who is an art, a photographer, artist, writer, um, based in London and Associate Professor at uh, the University of Coventry, the Centre for Arts, Memory and Communities. Maybe not in that order. <laughs> um, and his, I mean, he has had a very full, very rich career. You started around what year? Um, as of 2002 was when 2000. my work really became uh, of the form that, that I'm going to be presenting today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and his is career is always, um, you, I mean, it's always um, on new project or new projects, in fact. Um, and I had the pleasure to meet Anthony in London, I think around 2019. Um, and um, he has contributed to this volume that I'm happy to say was supported by Klima, uh, called Contemporary Photography as Collaboration. Um, where he expands um, on aspects of his practice around photography and collaboration, uh, which is central in his work, the idea of authorship um, and yeah, um, breaking, you know, this sort of uh, attitude of a photographer doing, you know, point and shoot photographs, but maybe um, um, including participants in the in the creation of the work. So you're going to um, uh, talk us through a number of projects that you've done. Um, um, and uh, yes, we'll have uh, questions after afterwards for, for you. Thank you so much, Mathilde. And I'd like to begin just by thanking you all for uh, for being here today, and, and in particular to Mathilde and Francois for uh, organizing for me to be with you. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so I, over the past 20 years, I have worked with individuals and groups of people, inviting them to collaborate with me to speak out about their lives, experiences, and the things they are interested in. Throughout this time, I have wor worked with a wide range of people, including individuals with experiences of mental health issues, people with addiction problems, individuals who have experienced homelessness, children from lower socioeconomic households, and people who identify as LGBTQ+. The way that I work is participatory, collaborative, and socially engaged. That is, I am invested in methods of co-production, facilitation, pedagogy, and collaboration. The drive that propels all of my work is to use the skills and resources I'm able to access and organize, to shake up preconceptions, and in doing so, to lobby for change. By critically inquiring into issues of access, power, representation, and social justice, at the heart of what I do is an ambition to work with people who are overly spoken for, to speak out about their experiences and the systems and services that shape their everyday lives. Underpinning my practice is an attempt to recalibrate the relationship between a photographer and subject by inviting participants to take part in a process of facilitation, pedagogy, dialogue and co-creation the methods I employ are informed by visual research methodologies of the social sciences, including autophotography, secondary data and archival study, image elicitation interviews, focus groups, and expressive data collection. The conceptual inquiry, theoretical grounding, and pedagogical impulse of my practice is informed by the writings and practices of anthropologists and sociologists, such as Johann Fabian and Norbert Elias, techniques developed by the theater practitioner Augusto Boal, the social design work of performance artists such as Lois Weaver, and approaches to radical education developed by Paolo Freire, Ivan Illich, and Bell Hooks. In particular, Freire's model of education a dialogical practice that seeks to enable critical consciousness by uncovering the systems and processes that normalize exclusion and oppression has continued to drive one of the questions that has remained central to my practice for 20 years. How can a photographer address the power imbalance between them and the people they represent? Each project I create brings together multiple voices 
to express narratives about the lived experience of participants and present information about the process of our work together. The process I facilitate when working with participants encompasses a range of activities from the development of skills to enable the elicitation of information and responses in relation to a specific issue through to community organizing and social action. Critical reflection on the progression and culmination of this process informs the methods of inquiry and presentation strategies I bring to future collaborations and the creation of new work. A significant thread running throughout my practice over the past four for over 20 years now is the long-term collaborative projects created with people who have experienced homelessness in cities and towns across the United Kingdom. In places such as Belfast, Birmingham, Brighton, Colchester, Coventry, Manchester, and in boroughs all over London, I've worked with hundreds of people. And through this process, I've collated thousands of photographs, video, sound recordings, and other pieces of ephemera created by the participants that express their points of view and visualize experiences of some of the most marginalized people in society. So today, what I'd like to do is just share with you a few relatively recent projects, and I thought I would begin with Frequently Asked Questions. Frequently Asked Questions grew out of a, a, another project called Assembly. An assembly was made in Brighton between 2012 and 2014 with over 50 people. It was commissioned by the Brighton Photo Fringe. As part of assembly, I initiated a partnership with the Brighton Housing Trust, which is a service for people experiencing homelessness in Brighton. And in the first year, I spent time getting to know the staff and individuals associated with two of their services, a hostel called Phase One and the First Base Day Centre. I worked in the kitchens, helping to make and serve breakfast and lunch, volunteering in the centre, getting to know people. It was an important part of my process, this developing relationships and a way to consult with people about the work that I was looking to create. I then invited participants to use cameras and digital sound recorders to capture their experiences. I met with participants regularly to discuss their images and sounds and to record conversations. And participants were also invited to learn how to use digital medium format camera equipment over repeated sessions to create what I call an assisted self-portrait. Alongside this, I collaborated with the Cascade Chorus, which is a choir of people in recovery. And together we sang and we recorded and we created a performance for the exhibition. And when the exhibition was exhibited in the Phoenix Gallery, which you've just been seeing in these previous few slides, over 70 photographs were displayed, including images created by participants, documentation of us working together, and the assisted self-portraits. And alongside the work on the walls, there was also a 45-minute soundscape that weaved out audio recordings playing in the space. A piano was donated by Phase One, one of the um, hostels and tables and chairs were lent by First Base, the day centre, and we installed these in the gallery and we transformed the gallery into a community hub where a range of activities took place with different audiences. And visitors were invited to participate in discussion events, to play the piano, or spend time contemplating information in the gallery about support and services available to people experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness in the UK. And when we were collectively uh, curating the exhibition, one of the things that we wanted to do was have a whole range of literature about the support service projects across the UK. And so with a research assistant, I pulled together all kinds of posters, charity reports, uh, service uh, activity uh, programs, and presented them back to the participants. And the people that I was working with described to me how they felt that those pieces of material didn't actually do anything other than really service the marketing ambition of the organizations paying for the material and didn't actually provide any questions about you know, the urgent needs of someone who's about to experience homelessness. And so I came about it in another way and worked with Gerald McClavity. And this is Gerald here. 
and we decided to send an email to the housing and homelessness departments in the top 44 by population local authorities around the country. I'm not too sure what the French equivalent is of a local authority, but it's essentially the, the city or the town or the region administration, and within them there are teams of people that work on homelessness and housing in particular. And so we thought what we would do is send an email written from Gerald's point of view as a homeless person, a set of questions. And I'm going to hand over to Gerald now and he'll describe uh, what that email was about. People become homeless for a variety of reasons. Some by choice and others by accident or bad luck. Anyone can potentially become a homeless person. After spending several years on the street experiencing homelessness firsthand, I've developed strong views on the subject. I believe that one of the most important things is to keep things as brief and simple as possible to avoid confusion. People can become ill, end up in prison, or even end up dead as a result of homelessness. I believe fighting homelessness is an ongoing battle that needs to be managed in the best possible way. There are many charities that claim to help the homeless, and a lot of the money made by these organisations often doesn't make it to street level, and is unnecessarily wasted on things like administration and overheads. Please answer the following questions. I am a homeless person without any money. Where can I go for something to eat or drink? Where can I find shelter when it is raining or snowing? Where can I go to the toilet during the day? Where can I go to a toilet during the night? Where can I get a bath or a shower? Where can I get clothes, footwear and a blanket? Where can I sleep during the night that is safe? Where can I go to use a computer? Where can I go to use a telephone? Where can I go to see a doctor? Where can I go to see a dentist? I dissolved this simple list of questions written from a homeless person's point of view. What do I need and what do I expect to find? I believe there are many places in the United Kingdom that do not have adequate answers to these questions. And I am trying to raise awareness in order to improve the situation for people in the future. It may even save lives. Thank you very much. We thought we'd get lots of really uh, useful information coming back from the housing and homeless departments, but actually mostly we got out of office replies that ignored Gerald, the sender, entirely. Sometimes they signposted to an online uh, resource or website that didn't actually address the concerns that Gerald had. But we thought that said as much about the state of legislated homeless support services than anything else. And so we compiled printouts of the email and all the correspondence with the local authorities and put them onto these blue clipboards into the gallery space as a way for visitors to consider the systemic issue uh, which uh, is involved here. And three years after the first outing of frequently asked questions within this exhibition of assembly, Throughout 2017, Gerald and I undertook a new round of research into 61 councils across the United Kingdom, which resulted in a presentation of the work at Tate Liverpool with the Museum of Homelessness. The Museum of Homelessness is a really interesting organisation uh, in the UK. It's involved in frontline direct support services, but it's also equally involved in research uh, and the intersection of arts and homelessness. And they've just opened their very first um, uh, site. But up until this point they worked peripatically within the existing frameworks of cultural institutions and so we launched the uh, the second round at the Tate Modern and this is Gerald speaking to an audience at the Tate Modern and then we designed an exhibition that took place at Tate Liverpool and the exhibition itself was a, an arrangement of posters that graphically described the inquiry and the performance of the local authorities. And so the audience could come along and see which local authorities re responded, didn't respond, or sent an automated reply. And we, added, we did a sort of top-line analysis of the responses in terms of 
whether they signposted, whether they honored the response time that they pledged, and whether or not the emails, some, some of the uh, emails were treated as freedom of information requests. I don't know if there's a similar system here, but in the UK you can put a freedom of information request through an official channel to any organization or individual and request a certain piece of information. It's a very lengthy and laborious process, and certainly not one whereby a homeless person who's asking where they can sleep that night would expect to be going through. But the exhibition was much more than a display of posters on a wall. For me, when I create exhibitions, I'm thinking very carefully about who the audience is, where the work is situated, and how audiences can be engaged. And so a really important part of the show was this section here called What Are Your Questions? Where the audience was encouraged to think about the kinds of questions that could be folded into future iterations of the project uh, around certain kinds of subjectivities or just questions that we didn't think necessarily necessarily to ask. And importantly, there was a, a public program of events. So here we partnered with Established Beyond, which are a collective of squatters in Manchester who gave a practical workshop inside Tate Liverpool on how to squat commercial properties. Squatting residential properties is illegal in the UK, but squatting commercial properties is not illegal. And so they gave a wonderful workshop on practically how to do it and what, to, what your rights are if you were kind of confronted by the legal authorities. We held uh, film screenings by local activist filmmakers and we had more formal uh, panel discussion events with academics, with CEO of charities, as well as people working in policy and local and national government from both the right and the left to come together to talk about the issues. And then we also had performances by the Choir With No Name, which are a choir of people who are experiencing homelessness. And so shortly after then, I was delighted to receive an invitation to uh, bring Gerald uh, and the work into the Houses of Parliament and to speak to MPs who sit on an, a cross-party uh, committee called the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Ending Homelessness. It was such a wonderful thing to be able to do, to be able to bring Gerald into the very seat of power in the UK, to sit across from the people who have the decision-making power uh, about his, his, his daily experience. And that was in June 2019, and, and shortly after then, the first piece of major uh, legislation, I think in something like 20 years, in relation to homelessness, came about. It was called the uh, Homelessness Reduction Act. And in this piece of legislation, it imposes greater responsibility or duty on the local authority to provide uh, uh, services. Um, and uh, to respond to individuals. And so we thought it was a really timely uh, moment to do another round. And so we sent out a further um, a survey, to this time to 110 local authorities. And we organized exhibitions that took place in Bristol and in London. And again, central to the event uh, of the exhibition were public engagement events. And so here we have a long table format event. A long table is a format of public events that I borrow from Lois Weaver, uh, the feminist theater academic uh, and performer uh, who has a company called Split Britches, a uh, brilliant woman. And she devised this, this sort of format whereby you invite uh, in individual speakers to come along and, and sit around a table and take it in turns. and, and people in the audience come up to the table. It's, it's, it's really difficult to describe without doing it. But it really breaks down the power imbalance of, of a speaker on a stage and an audience in, a, in an auditorium. Uh, and so we had uh, members from the Bristol City Council, we had lawyers, we had uh, people with lived experience as well, as well as people that work for various homelessness support and addiction charities. We also, I also partnered up with a, a, an arts organization called IC Visual Lab and uh, uh, an, an, um, an archaeologist uh, from Oxford University called Rachel Kiddy. Rachel has an extraordinary research practice whereby she trains people who are not archaeologists but have a subjectivity or a lived experience to be able to take part in an archaeological dig that relates to an aspect of their lived experience. So she's done extensive work with people who, with lived experience of homelessness on archaeological dig sites that relate to the experience of homelessness in the 19th century. And so so she and the IC Visual Lab, we, we staged a, a two-day workshop for researchers and artists to think about the ethical issues in archiving. 
I also commissioned uh, a really wonderful uh, platform called Photo Pedagogy that provide resources for secondary school teachers and their students uh, in art and photography classes around some of the critical and ethical issues to think about when representing homelessness. And so we also staged the exhibition in London at the Foyles Bookshop on the fifth floor. The Foyles is a five-story bookshop in central London, which has uh, an extraordinary number of people that pass through it on a, on a weekly basis, something like 30,000 people. And so we staged this exhibition, bringing together the work from Assembly, but also the three iterations from Frequently Asked Questions. And. Uh, and we also, again, uh, staged um, public events. Uh, this one, was, we had over, I think it was like 19, 18, 19 speakers coming from a range of backgrounds. Central to the invited list of speakers were people with lived experience of homelessness, of course, as well as doctors, nurses, psychologists, theatre makers, literature his, uh, theorists, historians, and artists who all make work or respond to uh, homelessness. And together, we kind of exchanged our views on different creative tactics. And we also had um, uh, a, a performance by the choir with no name as well. This was on the 27th of February. That was the last public event that I did before the, the world went into lockdown. And what was kind of challenging about that is we had just, we, the next stage in the project was to send this publication. I've got two copies here, which you're more than welcome to, to take a look at. Um, Mathilde, would you mind passing that and the other one around? Thank you. The idea with the publication was to present uh, the data, but rather than, you know, it wasn't for sale in bookshops, etc. what we did is we, we sent it to all 110 local authorities, to all of the housing and homelessness officers, to MPs and councillors and ministers in the departments for housing communities and local government in each of the devolved nations. And we also sent it to the members of the all-party parliamentary group for ending homelessness. And I mean, it was a huge undertaking. And, you know, I think what was really wonderful about that is various uh, people from the different local authorities confirmed how it stimulated policy debate within the council and informed the work that they do uh, or informed the communications between the diff disparate council groups. Um, there was all kinds of really positive information that came back from the MPs and the local authorities about the impact that the work had had. So, but we weren't able to send out the book until, so how do I describe this? So in the UK, when the pandemic took, happened, the first lockdown happened, the government introduced something called Everybody In, which was uh, um, a scheme whereby uh, local authorities were charged with the duty of putting homeless people into hotels. And so we waited for that everybody in scheme to, to come to an end, and then we sent out the book. And that's when that um, discussion with the, with the uh, recipients uh, took place. I'm going to move on quickly. How are we doing for time, Matilde? Doing great. Oh, great. Oh, perfect. Great. So I thought I would share with you another project called Agency. And Agency um, was and in, came about through an invitation from the UK City of Culture. So um, the UK City of Culture is a, a biannual event that happens in a different city. Is it biannual or maybe it's every four years? I can't remember. Gosh, I can't remember. Anyway, um, it happens in a different city in, in, uh, with each iteration. Uh, and in 2021, it took place in Coventry. I was invited to work with people experiencing homelessness in Coventry around, I don't know, like the beginning of 2020. But of course, we then went into lockdown. And ordinarily, when I make work with people experiencing homelessness, I spend up to a year working in a kitchen. So one of the ways that I develop rapport, establish trust, get to know the staff of the organization and get to know the the clients of the organization who may then become participants in the project is to, to spend as much time volunteering and often through food. I like to cook food. I'm very good at cooking food for large groups of people. Um, and so it's a way I can kind of be involved. And the thing is, is because 
the world went into lockdown, um, the charity organizations also had to radically change the way they work. So I wasn't able to do that. But what I did do is I, I was involved in setting up an online forum with an organization called Arts and Homelessness International. So we set up a monthly forum, a city-wide network of individuals with lived experience of homelessness, as well as representatives from the arts and social sector organizations across Coventry to come together to, to perform a support network in this sort of very confusing and confronting, challenging time. But what that also enabled me to do was to establish links and develop rapport with people working within charities. And so through doing that, I was able to uh, partner with a man called De Ben Davenport, who worked for a charity called Crisis. And we began to provide workshops in the hotels that were provided by the Coventry local authority as part of the Everyone In initiative. And, um, and then when the public restrictions changed, we moved the, um, the workshop into an outdoor area of a cafe. And so I invited participants to work with me to learn how to use medium format camera professional equipment over repeated sessions to create assisted self-portraits. I also invited people to take away disposable cameras to photograph the things that they're interested in. And their experiences. And so here we have an assisted self-portrait of Benji. And this is Bernie Howarth. Sure. Yeah, so um, Mathilde just prompted me very kindly, thank you, uh, to, to just to sort of mention a few words about assisted self-portrait. No, no, it's good, it's good. So what I mean by that is I invite the participant to take me to a place that is significant to them in some way. And in that location, I teach them how to use the equipment. Uh, before the, um, the sort of, uh, uh, before digital photography, I used to use uh, a large format plate camera. Uh, now I use a digital medium format camera, which is a, a professional piece of equipment, which has quite a large screen on the back. And you can see me and Ali are kind of looking at the screen. And the, the camera is tethered to a laptop as well, so we can look at, the, mater look and look at the, uh, the images and the work we're doing on the laptop. And as a pedagogical tool, that enables me to teach people not only the technical ha the sort of uh, considerations about photography, uh, how to use the apparatus, but also to, to consider the representational value of the choices that you make when using the equipment. So how, how you stand, how you pose, the background, the composition, how all of these things become the storytelling tools of the photographer about what the images depict. And I call it an assisted self-portrait because I know that it's working well when the participant draws upon me as an assistant to their own self-making process. So it's very much a collaborative uh, endeavor, but the idea is that I'm showing you how to do it and you become so familiar with how to do it that you, you do it and I'm there as a support uh, in, in the creation of the self-portrait. This is Mick Bickley. And yeah, normally we do it like, you know, as many times as, as the person will be able to. So sometimes that's two or three, sometimes that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen. It really depends on the individual. This image here of Mick Bickley, this assisted self-portrait of Mick, was made on his 65th birthday. And so on that day, he thought that it would be a good idea to go to where he was born. So he was born in the room behind those windows on the right-hand side of the image. And so it was a really moving uh, day where we were making a portrait of Mick on his 65th birthday outside the house in which he was born. And the current occupiers came out and asked us what we were doing. And Mick took great delight in talking about his recollection of living in the house and the current owners were, were delighted to hear about this as well. Here we have uh, Amy Howard. Amy is an extraordinary woman. She uh, has autism and uh, qu quite, quite sort of, um, yeah, I mean, qu quite challenging at times for her because people often don't quite know how to um, engage with her because of the way in which she presents or her autism presents. Uh, but she's also an incredibly gifted writer and she recently wrote a book called Autism and Me uh, and it's about her experience of homelessness uh, as an autistic person. This is Amy Howard. And then we have Cecilia Stower. 
and this is Robin. Here we have Martin and Sue Sadler and John Keeley and Jason Reed and Arshak and Tracy Villas. So when it came to the project culminating, um, I knew that I wanted to show the work in a public space rather than a gallery. I also knew that I wanted to create a community newspaper. I quite often work with the format of a community newspaper because newspapers can be produced relatively cheaply at really big print runs and can be distributed widely. Mathilde, would you do me a favour and pass the agency newspapers around? Thank you so much. And so collectively, the participants and I um, devised a presentation strategy for the exhibition that drew upon the visual lexicon of the materials that are used in the housing market to sell and to rent properties in the UK. So these display boards are, are, are kind of ape the, uh, the, 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 the physical structures that are put outside buildings. Um, and then this newspaper was collectively edited with the participants. Bernie in particular took a great um, kind of role in the sequencing and design, which we then gave over to a professional designer who interpreted the instructions for the production of the newspaper. And the location is really important as well. So Coventry itself as a city, the main train station has a pedestrian route that goes through to the city centre. On one side, on the right hand side of the image, is a, a green space. On the left hand side of this path, which is the main path into the city centre from the train station, are rows and rows of shops, which are predominantly real estate agents. And locally, that strip is called Real Estate Agent Row. And so that kind of inspired us to think about the term agency as the title for the work, not only in terms of referring to the, um, the, the housing market and its role structurally, systemically in homelessness, or uh, perpetuating homelessness, but also the, the way in which agency uh, as, a, as a concept, as an embodied experience, is impacted upon when you're experiencing homelessness, but also to refer to this notion of agency whereby in the photographic transaction, the photographer traditionally is able to exert a greater level of agency over their subjects in a traditional documentary approach, which is what I'm trying to break down through the socially engaged practice. There was a range of public events for, uh, for the work in Coventry. And then we were invited to display the work in Landskrona in Sweden uh, at a photography festival and a group exhibition uh, alongside artists that uh, work on various social justice issues. And then we were invited to display the work in uh, Oslo, in Norway, um, as part of uh, a big uh, photography festival there. A really wonderful gallery called Vasily Sousa invited to showcase the project. And we displayed the work in three ways. We had an exhibition of the assisted self-portraits and selection of the works by the participants in the old public library, as well as a new Norwegian edition of the newspaper, which was distributed across Oslo. And then we also displayed the work outside um, in one of the main sort of thoroughfares in Oslo as well, uh, which is coming up in a few slides time. Uh, yeah, so here. So outside we displayed the sort of the documentation of the making of the portraits and inside we had the portraits and the photographs by participants. When the um, project culminated in Coventry, um, the participants were really keen to continue working together and decided to work independently as what they call the Agency Photography Collective. And so myself and colleagues work with them to support them in their own uh, kind of endeavours. Uh, and so here we have the uh, Agency Photography Group's uh, first exhibition, which was held um, at Warwick University in the Faculty of Arts building in a gallery space called Fab. And uh, it was really it's really wonderful to kind of continue to be able to support them uh, in the ways that they want to work together, but also individually uh, for their own kind of creative aims too. And here we have Mick and John and Tracy and Bernie and Sue and Amy and Ali and Arshak. So I thought I would also just share with you another project. <laughs> 
Um, this one is called Construct. And this one began in 2018. And I uh, was invited by a really interesting uh, photography arts uh, commissioning organization called Grain Projects to create or to further my work with people experiencing homelessness in Birmingham. And I began by uh, spending time volunteering in the kitchen uh, at an organization called Cypher Fireside. And Cypher Fireside is the main center for adult homeless people uh, in Birmingham. And they provide all kinds of services from healthcare to accommodation uh, to employment, uh, as well as providing meals and shower facilities. And so I spent time uh, just over a year or so volunteering in the kitchen, helping to prepare and serve meals. And then um, I also through that time was consulting with the staff and the, and the, the clients of the organization about how to proceed. Uh, you know, what time of the day, what day of the week, should I be doing this at all? Are there particular individuals who might be interested? Um, and so, and then I began to set up uh, meetings and workshops. The challenge was, is that this was all kind of getting underway in 2018 and then in um, 2019, sorry, 2019, and then at the beginning of 2020, of course, the lockdown happened. And Cypher Fireside had to close the way it worked. And so I was able to work with the majority of participants remotely by post, by email, um, by telephone, by Zoom. And then as the restrictions changed, I was able to work with people uh, in uh, different kinds of ways that were informed by the health practices that we had to observe. And over the four years, over 50 people took part and um, they used disposable cameras to document their experiences as well as camera phones as well to share images with me. Um, and we worked towards an exhibition which took place in 2022, October 2022, in the main public square in Birmingham called Snow Hill Square and one of the main train stations called Snow Hill Station. And we collectively, uh, one of the things that I noticed in the photographs that the participants were making was the level of construction work taking place in the city. And especially at the time of the pandemic because that was one of the few industries that was allowed to continue was construction. So for people experiencing home homelessness on the street, it's empty streets, but lots of construction. And uh, so this was really notable in the photographs. And then in conversation with participants about this construction, we got talking about the notion of homelessness as a social construct, as well as uh, the way in which the debris or the ephemera of uh, the construction industry becomes so kind of overlooked in our everyday experience of the urban environment, much like people experiencing homelessness as well. And so I designed these sculptural installations using um, scaffolding and netting as uh, a way to display, as frames to display the, the portraits. And there were uh, 21 assisted self-portraits uh, and in the square. And then inside the station, we displayed uh, documentation of the portraits being created, as well as photographs made by participants on disposable cameras and, and mobile phones. Again, uh, public events uh, with the participants taking center stage was really important. We had a wonderful uh, um, uh, performance, singing performance by Jeff. There was a long table event involving uh, people from the local authority, the city officers uh, at Birmingham City Council, as well as people's lived experience, as well as some of the key charity organizations uh, in, uh, in the UK uh, for people experiencing homelessness. We had choir performances, we had spoken word, and participants were uh, invited to give speeches at the launch of the event as well. And I also uh, provided, uh, or um, invited rather, uh, invited participants to take part in media opportunities uh, as they come up too. So here we have Movet uh, speaking with the BBC uh, radio. And then after the exhibition, collectively with participants, I've been working with them to re-look at all of the photographs and to make a new selection and to design a book. And so we've been working on the production of a publication called Construct, which comes out in a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks time, which is very exciting. 
And here's just a few um, uh, examples of the double page spreads which will feature uh, the participants' photographs as well as documentation of us working together as well as the assisted self-portraits. Uh, it also features two um, invited pieces of writing, one by um, Joseph Anderton, who's uh, a professor of literature at Birmingham City University, who focuses on the representation of homelessness in contemporary literature. And so together we have this dialogue about the representation of homelessness in, in visual art practices and in literature. And we also have an invited uh, contribution by Halima Sakrani from University of Birmingham uh, about the housing market and uh, in the UK and more more specifically uh, in uh, the West Midlands. So, yeah, um, I've got another project I could talk about. Do we have time? I mean, I, I could go on all day, but I know we don't want to go on all day. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, a really recent project which was exhibited from June to September last year is called Conditions of Living. And, you know, it was through my work made with people experiencing homelessness for over 20 years that I've been really involved in a number of grassroots organizations and campaigning groups and charities and research projects which examine systemic issues relating to homelessness, poverty and housing precarity. And, and through that kind of work, uh, being immersed in that world, I kept noticing this phenomenon of poor doors that was being reported in the media in the UK. And so I was like, what is a poor door? What does that mean? So in the UK, um, throughout the 20th century, a whole range of legislation uh, created the conditions for the creation of social housing, but also created the conditions for the dissolution of social housing or the selling off of social housing, most notably propelled by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. And so the challenge that most local authorities have is they no longer have housing stock to offer social housing. And so what they essentially do is sell off their or approve property developers' proposals for um, property developments so long as they include a certain percentage of what's called affordable housing or shared ownership or um, social housing. And so it's a way of the kind of neoliberal marketization of, of social housing, essentially. Um, and so the challenge well, the challenge. The thing that I also kept noticing is that so many politicians have campaigned on the premise of outlawing, social, uh, outlawing uh, the creation of poor doors. And I was like, what is this poor doors thing? So when property developers create apartment buildings and include a certain percentage of social housing within market rate housing, often the market rate housing has a grand entrance with a lobby. Sometimes there will be cafes, gymnasiums, cinemas, restaurants, and other public spaces or community spaces. The social housing side, generally most of those entrances are down alleyways, often next to bin stores. Uh, usually there's, there's no public space apart from the lift or the corridor. And too often, many of these places, the social housing windows overlook playgrounds that are only available to the children of the market rate housing, and the social housing children are not allowed to access those playgrounds. It's ludicrous. London is one of the last major cities in the Western world to, uh, to outlaw this practice, and so many politicians at local and national government promise to do something about it, and they don't. And so, I spent, uh, well, I was invited by a really amazing gallery called Four Corners in Bethnal Green. And the invitation from Four Corners was to work with them to co-curate an exhibition which would address representations of home and homelessness in East London from the 19th century to the present day. And I was delighted to accept this invitation, not only because I wanted to be involved in looking at that history, especially because the work I made with people experiencing homelessness in the early 2000s also took place in the area that we were going to look at. But I saw an opportunity to ask for support to create a new project which would uh, look at this notion of poor doors. And very kindly, um, 
Four Corners was able to support the, the production of this new project with funding and so alongside working with Carla Mitchell and the team at Four Corners to co-curate the exhibition um, which brought together a, a whole range of practices from the late 19th century to today which look at housing and homelessness not only in terms of documentary photographers but also um, uh, community grassroots social action so the rent strikes that took place uh, in the 1920s uh, a whole it was it's a whole range and actually there's a, a little catalog down there which you're welcome to take a look at as well thank you so much um, so with a research assistant we spent about a year and a half uh, examining this phenomenon of poor doors and locating as many uh, buildings that have poor doors as possible a better way to, to use, a better term than poor doors, of course, would be to say economic segregation in housing developments. And so what we did is we located eight housing developments in Tower Hamlets, which is the local authority around the gallery, that have economic segregation. And we worked with an organization to advise us on how to engage uh, as many of the participants, as many of the households in the eight housing developments as possible. There was around about a thousand households in the eight developments. And so we did, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about the design and um, approach of our invitation. And we sent out an invitation to all 1,000 households and invited them to take part in a community forum. And so brought together from almost a thousand households in eight developments, participants in the Conditions of Living Community Forum came from a range of housing tenure backgrounds, from social and affordable rental accommodation to shared and sole ownership. And using photography, sound recordings, and discussion-based activities that were facilitated to enable participants to share their personal experiences of living in these developments, we worked with the Community Forum to consider how economic segregation operates and how restrictions expand outward from separate entrances to access to amenities, resources, and public space. And then through group workshops and individual meetings, participants were invited to explore issues relating to why some buildings have segregated entrances and how architecture and planning affects access to key social rights, such as healthcare, culture, the environment, education, and transport. And we used um, the five livability factors as defined by the Economist Intelligence Unit and the Global Livability Index as a framework to progress discussions about the participants' experiences of place and segregation in which they live. And the Economist Intelligence Unit and the Global Livability Index essentially rank cities around the world, I think every year, in relation to uh, stability, how safety and security of a city, including crime rates and access to emergency services, healthcare, education, infrastructure, which incorporates uh, basic infrastructure such as housing and transportation systems, but also public utilities and communication networks, um, as well as culture and environment, which considers the quality of the natural and built environment, as well as the availability and quality of cultural amenities such as museums and parks and entertainment venues. And we use that as a framework to, to, to develop the discussions uh, and to focus our work to think about the question, what does segregation or inequality look like where you live? And so segregation in housing developments can occur in a variety of ways, through physical doors leading to different parts of the building, through separate floors to assigned to non-market rate flats or the so-called affordable housing units. There may be distinct internal segments of the same building, usually with isolated lifts, or there might be entire blocks within a wider complex. And sometimes specific amenities are restricted to certain residents based on the type of unit they live in. Essentially, local authorities allow property developers to design poor doors into their housing developments and consequently embed segregation therein. And as I mentioned, London is one of the world's last major cities yet to ban poor doors, despite years of political proclamations against the segregationist practice. And 
So the participants and I were building this body of work to in be included in this historical exhibition that brought together work from the late 19th century to today. And so we looked at these maps here, which were created by Charles Booth in the late 19th century. And what he did is he ranked um, right down to house and street level, according to a color code here, which I can't quite read out now, um, uh, a kind of um, classist, but also um, um, uh, like economic background of the residents, uh, quite with quite problematic terms. So you know, um, that's exactly right. Yes, yeah, so criminality was a big, a big feature. More recently, a version of that is called the Indices of Deprivation Index, and, and these are from 2019. Um, they've been cleaned up in the sense that they no longer kind of uh, make these proclamations about uh, you know, uh, criminality in relation to poverty, um, but they do look at the kind of um, uh, the proclivity of um, kind of social and economic background in particular areas of London. And so we, we kind of designed a set of <laughs> graphics that condensed the key pieces of information that was generated through this process with the community forum. Starting with the kind of socioeconomic factors in Tower Hamlets, the local authority, but also social housing in the UK and how, you know, for instance, um, between 1945 and 1980, there were 4.4 million social housings built, an average of 126,000 per year. Um, and, you know, uh, in now, there are fewer than, there are much fewer homes available than what there were in 1980s. There's a sort of gradual decline, which we kind of charted through, through this particular one. We kind of gave this sort of breakdown of, of the, uh, the kind of different types of tenure and access and the amenities, as well as thinking about, well, what are the kind of legal frameworks that could be drawn upon to outlaw the, uh, the practice at, in terms of local policy, in terms of English law, and also in terms of international law. We also created a timeline that mapped uh, the creation of legislation from, I think, 1864 right through to today, and the, the, party, uh, the parties that were behind, uh, whether it was conservative, labor, or liberal, that were behind the, uh, the creation of the legislation that essentially enabled uh, the creation of social housing, but also the dismantling of social housing. Um, and I also spent time photographing the entrances themselves on the housing developments, I think it's pretty clear which one is which. And the thing is, is that the doors is only one thing. It's also about the, the sort of geospatial uh, environment. And so I was trying to think about how to represent that. And so I was using kind of, um, you know, uh, online platforms like Google Earth to think about how the, these sort of spaces are rendered. So on the left, we have this little um, kind of alleyway which goes to the social housing of this building here. And on the right, I don't know if you can see very clearly, but there's a, um, a, a really really designed uh, parkland uh, which opens up into a lobby with a concierge. So thinking about the location of, of where those uh, entrances are and really just trying to sort of um, visually experiment with the language of mapping with the language of architecture and planning as well as the sort of photography practice um, uh, which obviously I, I come from. And we resulted in creating these um, representations of the housing developments, which involved uh, the, the kind of uh, illustration, the architectural illustration, visualizations, as well as the photographs um, of the doors um, and uh, accompanied by a quote from the marketing literature, the very embodiment, okay. sorry, the, uh, the very embodiment of city living in the 21st century. Invest in all. No, no, not at all. No. Invest in Oldgate Place, the home for your capital. Designed for a brighter lifestyle. Boasting sustainable modern living and impressive designs. 
This was one of the worst I felt. It was a really massive um, estate, and the social housing are literally next to the bin stores, which are not badly maintained, always overflowing. And the grand entrance that the market rate have is just extraordinary. An elegant contemporary design aesthetic and a wealth of excellent facilities, it says. A sensational collection styled to the last exquisite design detail. Like a blade of light, its glass fin protruding dramatically. We were also experimenting with um, responding to some of the uh, activist practices that took place in the same area in the Docklands in the 1970s and 80s, most notably Peter Kennard and... Um, so, and that's right, yes, that's right, Lorraine Leeson. Uh, not, not Peter Kennard, sorry. Um, oh gosh, my brain has had a moment. Done. Peter Dunn, that's right. Sorry, sorry, this is being recorded as well. How terrible. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. I'm sure they'll forgive me. Um, and sort of up, so they created these incredible billboard works that used slogans and imagery to protest against the, um, the development and displacement of local communities in the city of London where many of these housing developments are. And so we were experimenting with a similar sort of visual strategy uh, in some of these works here, which were then um, displayed also on, on um, billboards um, in, in East London. And so here we have um, some documentation of the exhibition. Four Corners, the gallery, um, is the, uh, the contemporary uh, child, if you like, of two community projects. Uh, the community photography project, uh, camera work, as well as the community video project called Four Corners. And they're currently located in a building on Roman Road in Bethnal Green in East London, which was in the 19th century, the very building itself was a hostel for homeless men. And so it's, it's a really interesting interesting kind of location, I think, to be producing this exhibition. And so we began the exhibition with documentation of the building uh, when it was a hostel for homeless men and moved through the centuries, uh, through the century, uh, well, I could say century in a bit, um, to look at many practices uh, by both photographers, collectives, uh, campaigners, uh, through photographs, but also through ephemeral literature. Um, uh, looking at different ways of thinking about and representing uh, home and homelessness in East London. <coughs> and within that, I mean, I, I, I was really grateful for the opportunity, not only for the work I did in the early 2000s to be included within this sort of rethinking of the canon, but also to include this new work as well. Um, and the work itself was a mixture of the developments, uh, pull quotes by politicians, uh, the research panels that I showed you some of, a, a, a great big timeline of the legislation, as well as uh, photographs by participants and myself of the developments, as well as handwritten text panels by participants that talk about their views of living in economically segregated housing developments, which say things like, every day I go through these doors, I feel really, really angry. I feel so angry. This land was given to investors to pocket money from poor people. How can I walk through this door and be happy? And this one says, using the words poor doors, well, the UK is very class differentiated. You open your mouth and people straight away put you in the box of the class system. They know where you've been to school, where you've been to university. That's absolutely horrible. How can we break the class difference perception? I was born and brought up in this area. You know, I'm 50 years old, so I've seen 50 years the development around here, of development around here. This was empty land. There was a road, a one-way street, and it's now a massive three-lane road. The developers and the local government have betrayed us. They've betrayed local people in the name of social housing. Social housing is a beautiful concept. Its concept is beautiful, but its implementation, that's the question. The opportunity to give everyone equally a place to live. But some social housing is not as nice as other housing, and there is a stigma. So accompanying the exhibition, we had a, again, we had a range of different public engagement events from 
uh, guided walks with historians through different areas within Tower Hamlets to consider the, uh, the, the, the creation of some of the first social housing developments, film screenings, uh, as well as a, a long table event which brought together campaigners and activists, academics, uh, all kind of working towards uh, uh, different kind of social housing uh, issues. How are we going for time? Well, hour, oh, I'm so sorry. That's very long. But you might be tired. And um, were you going to, you know, embark on a new project? Well, I was just going I think to you can very, know. very quickly, really quickly, just to say that I think um, okay. right now, as in in the background. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I won't be, I, no, literally just a few moments. I just thought it'd be really nice to talk to you about this project here called Families Living in Temporary Accommodation. So since 2022, I've been embedded in a team of focused care practitioners that work for a healthcare service in Greater Manchester that provides services for families that live in temporary accommodation. So when a family is experiencing homelessness, it becomes the duty of a local authority to move them into temporary accommodation. The reasons that families face homelessness are numerous. They could be fleeing domestic violence, they could be facing eviction, or struggling to meet the cost of increasing rent. There are 109,000 households in temporary accommodation in England, which includes 142,000 children. By comparison, there are only, and I shouldn't say only, but there are 3,900 people experiencing street homelessness. So families living in temporary accommodation is a huge issue. And so I've been working with uh, community midwives, social workers, uh, and, and other GPs, other healthcare professionals that work within the Shared Health Foundation to meet with the families living in temporary accommodation, to create portraits with them, and to record conversations about their experiences of living in temporary accommodation. And this, um, this work, I'm in the process in fact, today I'm, I'll be sending stuff to the printers um, for an exhibition that will take place in the Houses of Parliament in something called the Upper Waiting Hall, which is a chamber outside of the House of Commons in, in Westminster. So it's, it's, a, it's a room that politicians, all politicians in Britain that are involved in government have to pass through in government and opposition. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a really kind of wonderful spot. And I, the, the challenge, as you might imagine, there's quite, quite tricky security issues with doing anything inside the Houses of Parliament. So we have literally an hour and a half to set up the exhibition. So I had to think really carefully about how can I design an exhibition to be put into a space that's not actually an exhibition space. So I was thinking about kind of freestanding um, structures based on laundry racks kind of old-fashioned laundry racks um, that will look like this. And this is the building here. This is the upper waiting hall. It's a very grand, very British, very establishment kind of building. And, uh, or room in the building, I should say. And there's just a few visualizations of what the exhibition will look like. And the exhibition will also be accompanied by well, not only photographs and captions, um, but also documentation of the work being made, as well as key stats relating to families living in temporary accommodation. I'm going to stop talking. I didn't realize I was talking for so long. Thank you so much for listening to me.